children of God. We've just been praying about that, haven't we? Sons and daughters of the living God. How exciting to know that, eh? And we've come together today, haven't we, to worship him and praise him and love on him and receive from him. So good time now. We're, we're going to be having that special time in our service where you may be seated, where we're going to come around the table of the Lord. So if the deacons could just give out the, the communion right now, that would be wonderful. So I hope you've all had a beautiful week with Jesus just gone by. Uh, yeah, I did too. I had my challenges, but Jesus saw me through them as he does. Amen. Now you'll notice that the deacons are actually giving, giving you a piece of bread with their gloved hands. So this, this is just a thing we've thought of doing just to make it a little bit more, um, you know, more healthier. So they'll select the bit of bread and you can pick the, the juice. So yesterday I was actually reading a scripture which I thought would be something nice to just talk about over communion. And it's in John 6, 48. It's Jesus speaking to his followers all the way back 2,000 years ago and he's still talking to his followers today, yes. Sunday the 17th of January, <laughs> 2021 now. So he speaks to us today by saying this, I am the bread of life. This is, this is my body that I gave to you. That's verse 48. Verse 51, he's saying, if anyone eats of this bread, they will live forever. Then in verse 56, he says, those who eat of my flesh and drink of my blood abide in me and I in them. Now, as we think about this, maybe your thought first thought was drinking blood and eating flesh. That's pretty yucky, isn't it? So we know for surety that Jesus wasn't speaking in the literal. This is a spiritual thing that Jesus is talking about. I don't know about you, I'm, I'm sure... I'm sure you all feel the same. I want to be as close to Jesus as I possibly can be. I want to be one with him in mind and in body. One with him, walking with him, knowing, knowing what he, his attitude is to things, what his mind is, what his thoughts are, how he would how he would um, cope with situations that crop up, all that sort of thing. I want to be so close to him, to know, to walk in that oneness with him. And he actually wants that with us too. So that's what he says. For me, these scriptures mean drawing close to Jesus and as close to him each day as I possibly can. Surrendering to him, worshipping him, including him in everything I do each day, whatever, how small, however big, including him in my day, every day. Reading his word every day might be a small portion, might be a whole chapter, could be a whole uh, book of the Bible, but just having that input from his word. I want to pray each day. And you know, praying is just talking to Jesus, isn't it? Praying just means talking to God. Paul says you can pray without ceasing and you think, my goodness, does that mean I've got to spend all day on my, my knees? No, it doesn't mean that. It just means you're communicating with him every day, talking with him in your heart, in your mind, in your thoughts. I go about my unit, I live on my own, so I talk out loud to him each day. <laughs> People might think that I've got guests in the house, but I do. I have Jesus in the house. Um, so we want to draw on Jesus to be as close as him, to him as we can and to receive from him life, health, healing, strength to carry on. We all need that nourishment every single day, don't we? 
It is nourishment to draw close to him. And that's what I think he's saying when he says, drink of me, you know, drink, eat of me. Verse 53 in this same chapter says, if you don't drink and eat of me, there's no life in you. Wow, you're not of me. Meaning, I think, you may be alive physically, but spiritually you'll be dead. Jesus is saying here, drink me in. You will get all you need from me. God supplies all our deepest spiritual needs through Christ. Amen? Just like we need food to keep our physical bodies alive and healthy, if we stopped eating, we would be very weak, wouldn't we? Very weak. Same in the spiritual if we stop eating from the word, drawing from Jesus, receiving from him, if we stop that, we will become weak spiritually. And that's danger time. If we lose that, then we really get back into the world and, hey, all its temptations. And Satan's looking around for the weakest in us, isn't he? So we need the spiritual feeding from God through Jesus Christ every day to keep ourselves healthy and strong spiritually. His sacrifice, which we're going to celebrate and remember right now, means that all this wonderful stuff can happen in our life, all these wonderful blessings that he he gives us. We can be healthy. We can be strong spiritually in him. All our needs are met, his strength, his power, his power in us to live a victorious life. The victory is ours when we have Christ as the centre. I think that's what Pastor Graham said last week. You know, we have the victory. If you have Christ as head of your life, if you surrender to him and give it all over to him, then you will have a successful life in Jesus Christ. You can't help it because the Holy Spirit's there with you. And he's making sure that the victorious life will be yours. Overcoming every situation, every circumstance that comes across your life. So today, as we hold these emblems in our hands, just remember that Jesus said to us, as as often as you gather together, do this in remembrance of me. So we're remembering and thanking him. And we're just so grateful for what he's done for us in our lives. I'm sure you can... You could get up here and just sprout off so many blessings that you have. It's all because you believe in Christ. You believe he died for you. That's what it's all about. So can we just stand in honour of Jesus? If you, if you can't stand, that's fine. If you'd rather sit, it's more comfortable for you sometimes to sit with some people. So as you hold the emblems in your hand, have a look at them and know that that, that bread, that biscuit, that represents his body that was broken. Not, not actually broken as in bones broken, but it was broken open for you. And that juice that you hold, that his blood just flowed out. When, when he lost the blood, he, he lost it for you so that, that his blood can flow through you. Let's just thank him. I'm sure you're so grateful to him. And this is an opportunity right now to say thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you that I have healing when I I need it. Thank you that I have deliverance. Thank you that you're with me every hour and every minute of every day as I look to you. Trust him. Trust his Holy Spirit in you to do everything that is needed in your life. And just thank him right now. And and, and this is a good time just to ask him to forgive you for anything that you feel that you might have done wrong during the week, any sin that you might have thought, think that you've committed, any wrong attitudes, any wrong thoughts, any wrong behaviour. This is the time to get cleansed and washed. And you can get it right now. That's the miracle. The miracle of Jesus is that as you confess your sin in a genuine way, that you repent to him, He is right there. He can't wait 
for you to confess the sin so he can forgive and wash you once again. So God bless you as you partake. Those words, thank you, that just don't seem quite enough, do they? <laughs> How can you express the great thanks that we have for him? I think, I think really we can show him how much, how grateful we are by obeying him, obeying the word and doing what he wants us to do. So God bless you. You, might, you may be seated right now as we have the, have the announcements. So welcome to New Hope Church. I hope you're enjoying the half hour we've had here together worshipping him. So wearing a mask at church is not compulsory. You're very welcome to, to wear a mask. No one's going to look at you any differently if you do. The masks are up there at the back or in the reception area if you'd like to take one. No problem at all. Okay, so um, stay connected. Join us at 5pm every Wednesday on Zoom. That's starting back this week. It's a Good opportunity if you feel like some fellowship. Just get on Zoom and um, join in the conversation. A bit of a laugh, a um, bit of prayer perhaps. Maybe serious sometimes, but it's just a fellowship time for the guys to get together. So jump on that. If you want any more information about that, um, just uh, ask Colin. Easy. <laughs> oh, we're starting back on our Bible studies, so... This Wednesday on Zoom is our um, Bible study with Pastor Graham. I did it last year and it's great. It's a lovely time. You're able to ask questions, jump in there and, and just chat about stuff as well. So it, it's great. So it starts at 10 a.m. on Zoom. Any more information, Pastor Graham's right there for you. Okay. So again... Again, we're, we're starting um, the podcast with Pastor Colin and Pastor Deb. Not this Thursday, the following Thursday. Got it right. And that's a great time. We're in the, in the time of revelation and um, getting some understanding about revelation. I don't know whether some of you can get, get a bit confused about revelation. It is revelation, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Sometimes we can get a bit confused about this, this stuff, but um, Pastor Colin just, um, you know, describes it so easy and simply to understand. So please join us. Any other information, ask Pastor Colin. He's right here for you. Our last Holy Spirit night was absolutely beautiful. Who was here for that? Uh, it was beautiful, wasn't it? The Holy Spirit, honestly, he just moves differently every time, doesn't he? It's like a different theme, a different, a, a different subject, whatever it is, and, and it's just absolutely beautiful. So come and be a part of that on 7th of February. We have one every month. So come and be a part of that. That's great. Women's Bible study, we've actually started that last Friday. Um, so it's every Friday. Time is 10 to around about 11.30, sometimes more. It's never any less, but it's more <laughs> around the 11.30. So fellowship around the world, word, that's great. So every Friday after, um, after our Bible study that we have, we have lunch together. So if you'd like to join us, it's open for all the ladies. All the ladies are very welcome to the Bible study, to lunch and to the craft afterwards. So please come and join us. You don't have to do a craft. You can just come and watch us. Watch us and have some, a nice chat, girly chat. Okay. Now, this is a full gospel college Bible uh, course going to be done this year. This is, this is the full gospel one. Um, these here listed are the things that you can, the subjects that you can take. So, there's a full-time course and there's a part-time course. The full-time course is a year. The part-time course is four years or three years? Okay. 
Okay. The odd, right, okay. So three or four years for the part-time course. If you'd like to join that, um, here you have your diplomas uh, of ministry. That would be absolutely wonderful. So if you want to be a part of that, again, go and get more information from Pastor Colin. Okay? Great thing to be doing. Okay, so with giving, giving of your tithes and your offerings... We have a wishing well up the back there. If you would like to give cash, just pop the cash in there. Uh, but if not, go to newhopechurch.com.au and give and press on the giving button. Easy to do it online if you would like to. Okay? And join us on Facebook. So without further ado, let us put our hands together for a great, great welcome to our Pastor Colin, who is going to bring the word. <laughs> Great to see you today. Bless you. How are you? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You've been a good boy this week, Graham. Praise the Lord. It's one, Glenda told me. Yeah. Just, uh, just give, give Pastor Graham a clap. <laughs> I'll get you back, bro. <laughs> I just apologise to anyone here who's a teacher because I'm going to tell a joke, okay? Okay, so a teacher's standing in a class and says, anyone here who's stupid, please stand up. And no one stands. And so she said, surely there's someone stupid in here today. And little Johnny stands up and she says, so Johnny, you're stupid. And he said, no, I just felt sorry for you who are standing alone. There's a time in my life when I only had teachers as friends, not because I was biased, but <laughs> it was just the way it worked out. I wouldn't have dared told that. Praise God. Okay, so are there any teachers here today? No, don't, don't identify yourself. I'll feel terrible. Okay. Okay. All the power of God lies in you. Amen? And I thank Sue for that, uh, that word in communion because it's verifying what I want to say today and all the power of God lies within you and you know we hear so much about the power of God but do we use the power of God? Do we use the power of God? Because it's there for each and every one of us to use. But you know no one else can access that for you except you. And if you decide not to, then it's never going to happen. There are people that I know today who are Christians who don't source the power of God. They don't use the power of God. And it's not because they wouldn't say, I believe what you're saying, Pastor. It's because they don't believe that God cares enough about them to work in their life. And, you know, there's probably a few here today who feel similar to that. That maybe you can believe for other people, but you can't believe for yourself. And God wants you to believe for yourself and for others. He wants you to believe big things. And I love our first verse. My, my title for this slide is Faith Activates God's Power. And so the theme verse is 2 Corinthians 9.8. If you can turn that up, even though, you know, we're kind of fast on the draw with the scriptures, I would encourage you to look them up if you've got a paper Bible. And um, it's good for us to know where these verses are and not just let them pass by in our heads, okay? So 2 Corinthians 9.8. It says, And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you always having all sufficiency in all things may abound to every good work. Now, you can just say it like that or you can describe it. What is that saying? It's saying incredible things. Incredible things. And this is why we need to meditate on the word. It's not just read it. Because you can, you can go through it. Who's, who's ever been reading the Bible and, you know, suddenly your mind's on something else but you're still going over the words? Anybody ever done that? And then you get to the end of the chapter and you realise you didn't read a thing, so you go back 
and read it again. It's, it's an incredible thing. Satan doesn't want us to understand the word. He doesn't want us to be people who receive the fullness of God's power and the fullness of his word. All of God's power lies within you. Within you. Shall I ask who believes that? There's two. Praise the Lord. God is able to make all grace, all grace abound to you. All means all and that's all all means. It just means everything. Okay. And what I really want to come to is that word abound because the word abound, if you look it up in the Greek, it means excess. It means abundance. It means superfluous. <laughs> I love those those words, because it's saying there's more than enough. There's more than what you need. Some of it you don't need. That's how much God wants to pour out upon you. And when we're saying, God, I have a need, I have a need, read 2 Corinthians 9.8. It's telling you that all grace, all power of God is there for you. Praise God. And then it doesn't stop there, because that's just the first bit. It says, may, all the, make, may God is able to make all grace abound to you. Now notice the word says, God is able to make all grace abound to you. It doesn't say he will. You know, I believe that's our responsibility to take that grace. Amen? To say, thank you, Lord. That's mine. I'm claiming it for myself. I'm claiming that miracle. I'm claiming that healing. I'm claiming that financial supply. I'm claiming the thing that I need, Lord, and I'm, I'm, I'm trusting in you because it says you're able to make all grace abound. And Lord, I'm not stopping you from being able to do that. Amen? And then it says that you always, always, always means always in time. It also means physically in all ways, doesn't it? In every way. It says that you always, having all sufficiency, there's that word all again, remember all means all and that's all all means, all sufficiency in all things may, and there's that word abound again, may abound to every good work. So you abound to every good work. You are not lacking. You are not lacking. You know, don't, you know, I've been convicted as I've, as I've prepared this word that, you know, even sometimes we just, we don't think that we have certain things and we kind of write them off and think that's right. Like it might be a gift or it might be an ability to do something. But God, when, when you come to the end of your ability, God is your ability. Yeah. Amen? Amen? God is your ability. Praise God. You know that old saying that says, you know, when you run out of your brains, use somebody else's. Okay. Well, you can use God's brain. Amen? You can use God's brain. Praise the Lord. That you, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Praise the Lord. Okay, let's have our next scripture. And it comes from, uh, from Matthew, sorry. Matthew 28, 18. And that's basically what it says. But you can check me. Okay, it says, All power is given to me in heaven and on earth, Jesus is saying. All power is given to me in heaven and in earth. All power. There's that word. What does all mean? All. all. That's right. It means everything. It means all. Okay. So let's go now and there's Habakkuk 2.4. Now here's what I, where I want to get into the meat of what I want to say today. Habakkuk 2.4. This is a verse that says the just shall live by faith. But I'm going to read it here. It says, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by faith. Now, in this, in this context of this verse, it's talking about somebody who's puffed up, somebody who's in the flesh, somebody who just thinks they're the greatest. Okay? And Habakkuk's asking God about this person and God's telling him, about this person. If you read the whole chapter, you'll get that. And there's several woes that come for him later on. But verse 4 says, But the just shall live by faith. What is that faith? 
It's faith in God. That's easy to say. But what I want to talk about today is the way we access the power of God. The way that we receive the power of God. The way that we can draw on all that power of God. All that grace that abounds. All of that sufficiency that abounds to us is yours today. Praise God. It's yours today. So let's go on to the next... Oh, I've got there... The just live by faith is found in, in four places in Scripture, and that's the four Scriptures. Habakkuk 2.4, Romans 1.17, Galatians 3.11, and Hebrews 10.38. Now, that's where it says those words, okay? But that's not the only place, of course, where that context is, okay? But I'm just telling you that's where those four verses are found. And it's interesting, isn't it? When people say, you know, I'm not an Old Testament Christian, I'm a New Testament Christian, that's, that's great, but do you understand that Jesus preached from the Old Testament? Do you understand that Paul wrote from the Old Testament and the disciples preached from the Old Testament? There was no New Testament for nearly 400 years after Jesus. So the church preached from the Old Testament. The gospel is in the Old Testament. And the just shall live by faith, the first incident of it is in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, where we've re just read. And so it's significant for us to understand that we're justified by having faith in God. Yes? We're justified by having faith in God. So let's go to our next scripture. Oh, I've got a few, haven't I? Um, actually, I'm not going to any of those scriptures but I put them up there because there are other important scriptures about faith. If you want to take a photo of that, you better hurry. But, um, yeah, there's nothing in there that I've... There's lots of scriptures I could have also put in there. I mean, obviously, faith is the main theme of the Bible, but other than Jesus, of course, but it's important for us to note where important scriptures lie and to keep a track of them, praise God. All righty. So let's go to our first poster. It says, when you choose faith instead of fear, it activates God's power. See, you've got to choose. Deuteronomy 30 verse 19 says, blessing or curse, you choose. Derek Prince wrote a book about it. And Graham's just studied it with several people. But it's a great book. But it's a great verse that God is saying, blessing or curse, life or death, I put you on record today what you choose. That's Deuteronomy 30, 19. So we are responsible for our faith, folks. And in today's world, in today's community, in today's situation, we need to be demonstrators of that faith. And I don't have this scripture up there, but I'm going to, I would like you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And I did read this last week, but I'd like to go to it. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verses 1 to 5. And I love this scripture. Because it tells us, sorry, didn't go. 1 Corinthians 2, this one. Okay, here we go. I love it because it's showing Paul in his weakness, if you like. But it's not a weakness because I am weak, but he is strong. I'm not strong, I'm weak. But I'm strong when I'm trusting in the Lord. I'm strong when I'm standing in his power. I'm strong when I'm trusting him and believing for good things to happen. And we as Christians are conduits in this world and never more importantly than today in our own lifetimes should we be demonstrators of the spirit and of power. And Paul says here, he says, And I, brethren, when I came to you, I didn't come with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. 
Paul just determined to know nothing but Jesus Christ and him crucified. He knew that God was his all-sufficiency. 2 Corinthians 9, 8, we just read. He knew that God had grace that would abound to him. And we as Christians need to be not thinking about consequences of what we might do. What we should be thinking about is that the power of God is standing with us whenever we do it. Amen. If we're led by God to do something, that means God wants you to do it and that his protection, his sufficiency, his all-encompassing power is with you. But you see, we can sabotage that. We can sabotage that. And that's why that verse, I go back to it, says God is able to cause all grace to abound to you, cause all sufficiency to abound to you. It's up to us to take the stand and say, Lord, I trust you. I trust you. Lord, I'm not looking at the circumstances. I'm looking to you, the author and finisher of my faith. I'm looking to you, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father, the one who overcomes and blesses us in all things. God is that great and mighty power that we have and we need to continue to trust in him. Praise God. So Paul is saying, I determine not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. Now, when the reason Paul's saying this is because when he went into Corinth, it was a very worldly town. If you've read 1 Corinthians, you realize that. But the power of God was upon him because he determined to know nothing except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And I tell you, when you're in trouble, determine to know nothing <laughs> except Jesus and him crucified and you'll come out. You'll come out well. Verse 3 says, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. So he was afraid. What, the mighty Paul was afraid? Yes. And I think this is recorded by Paul to encourage us. To encourage us to realize it's not me, it's God. It's not my power, it's God's power. And he it will deliver that power to me when I call upon him and when I trust in him. I'm not going to doubt, I'm not going to fear because God hasn't given me the spirit of fear. I'm going to believe you, Lord, and be justified by you for my belief. Praise God. And verse 4, I love, it says, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Woo! I love that. Give me a woo. Don't have to sound so excited. Woo. Woo. My little finger's getting excited. That is a powerful verse. Because it does not rely on you. It relies on Jesus. What, what your part is, is to trust him. That's your part, is to believe him, is to stand fast in him and receive the miracles and the signs and the wonders. Church, why do we see so many miracles in this church? Because we trust the Lord. Because we believe God. People get up here and say, well, it's happened again. Almost sound bored with it, you know, like God would do something else for a change and not do a miracle. That would be exciting. Not. not. But God is all powerful today. I sometimes, you know, I, I move in different circles and I talk to people and they say, you know, healing was for the disciples. And I go, no, it wasn't. It's for everybody who believes. I'm not having that old Calvinistic teaching. Apology to all Calvinists. Um, I'm having the power of God. And I'm having that power of God today, now. It's not pie in the sky when you die. It's steak on your plate and it's great, mate. <laughs> I want what God's died to give me. Amen? Yeah. Hell, it's your right. Yeah. It's your right. You are justified when you believe God. God justifies you by your faith. Praise God. Okay. Oh, that was just a poster. Boy, what's next? Hallelujah. 
the power of God that brought about the conception of Jesus and raised him up from the dead can bring your dreams, desires, expectations, plans to fulfillment and activate God's power with faith. Amen? That's how we activate God's power. You might have noticed that's not my handwriting. I didn't write that. Okay? But it's there. Praise God. Next one. Oh, is it a photo moment? Okay, that's enough time, Sam. Give me the next. I'm the pastor. (laughs) Faith activates God. Fear activates the enemy. I didn't even get one amen. Thanks for those... There's no, nobodies who said, Amen. Praise God. Okay, fear activates the enemy. Do you know that? Fear activates the enemy. When we're feeling fear, we've got to be really careful because we're activating the power of Satan in our lives. God didn't give us a spirit of fear. I've already said. Satan's the one who tries to make us afraid. Okay, let's go to the next one. And that's the next slide, I think. Seven steps to activate God's power. Okay, and I want to share these with you. All right, let's put the first one up. Seven steps to activate God's power. And if you want to activate God's power, follow these steps and it'll happen, okay? Now, you might think it's just have faith. Yes, it is, but I've kind of brought it down a little more and uh, these are some, some ideas from Napoleon Hill. The starting point is to have a definite passion and purpose, Okay? Do you know what your purpose is? Everybody has a purpose. We should find our purpose. It doesn't matter how old or young you are, you have a purpose. If you're still sucking air, you have a purpose. Okay? And God wants you to fulfill that purpose. So the question is, what is my calling? What is my calling? Do you know what your calling is? If not, you need to pray, Lord, what are you calling me to? Now, I'm not saying that's always an easy thing to find. It took me a couple of years, right through Bible college and beyond, to discover what really my giftings were. You know, I started to go to Bible college and there's guys there saying, I'm an evangelist, you know, I'm going to preach to thousands and... I'm going to get people healed and set free. What do you do? What, what's your calling? I go, I don't know. I just know this, I'm going to serve God. So it doesn't always come quick, but I tell you, the way to find out what your purpose is, is find out what you love to do. You ever notice you're really good at what you love to do? That's God's giftings. And God gives us purposes in the stuff that we love to do and that's you know when you first find that or get an idea about what that is you'll find as you go through life that it narrows down and the focus gets sharper and sharper and sharper as you go because God hones that in you and you come to a point of full understanding and I have something here from Napoleon Hill that says a definite purpose must be accompanied by a definite plan for implementation, followed by appropriate action. You have to have a purpose, you have to have a plan, and you have to start putting that plan into action. It's not too important that your plan be sound, because if you find that you've adopted a plan that's not sound, you can always modify it. But it's very important to be definite about what you're going after. What is your purpose? There can be no ifs or buts about it. All right, so you might, you might think, well, you know, I'd, I'd love to just pray for people and see them healed. Well, pursue that. Pursue it. You know, the great thing about God is if you start out in the wrong direction, he turns you around. <laughs> he turns you around. Isn't, that, isn't God's grace just great? There's nothing for us to particularly worry about missing it or anything like that because if our heart's right, God will lead us right. That's what matters. Praise the Lord. Number two, understand that all individual success is the result of an inner drive or motive. 
We must possess a drive for what we want to accomplish. You have to have a drive. Who's driven here? Who's the driven person? Okay. We have to have a drive about what God wants us to do and be going for it. Amen? Praise the Lord. We must possess a drive for what we want to accomplish. And so you have no right to ask anybody to do anything at any time without giving that person an adequate motive. And Graham, you're a salesman, a salesperson. And it says here that the, uh, the, the premise behind salesmanship is the ability to plant in the mind of, of a prospective buyer an adequate motive for his buying. When you purchase something, it's an emotional experience. You won't buy from a salesperson you don't like. You go somewhere else and you buy from the, the salesperson you like. It's an emotional experience. Also, you'll buy maybe what you need, but you'll find something you really like, and that's what you'll buy. Okay? So the nine, there's nine basic motives. I haven't got them up there, but I'll tell you what they are, and you can get them from me later if you like. There's self-preservation, there's financial gain, there's love, there's sexuality, there's desire for power and fame, there's fear, there's revenge, there's freedom of body and mind, there's desire to create. All right, let's go on to the third one. The third one is any idea, plan or purpose must be held constantly in the forefront of your mind combined with a burning desire for its realisation. See, desire has to go with faith. Ever notice when you go, yeah, you know, I, I believe for that, you know, but you don't really bother about it. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. Very, if it does, it happens very seldom. Yeah. You have to be very determined and desire that thing. If you don't desire it and it's not held in the forefront of your mind all the time and you're thinking about it, Sue said in communion that, you know, we pray without ceasing. Well, that's how we pray without ceasing when we're believing for healing. And, and those of you who've seen healing and join with me in trusting the Lord in things know that's true. You know this is true, don't you? We have to continue in a burning desire to see that thing come to pass. All right, the next one. Number four, any dominating desire, plan or purpose which is backed by faith will be taken over by the subconscious mind and acted upon immediately. I want to read something to you about the subconscious mind. Did you know that the conscious mind can handle 2,000 bits of information a second? That's pretty phenomenal, isn't it? Pretty phenomenal. And the subconscious mind can handle, get this, 400 billion bits of information per second. Do you know you are not a single, a single being? You are a community of beings. You are made up... Now, these are estimations, I know. I've looked it up and nobody really knows, but they guesstimate that you are made up of more than 37 trillion cells. Now, it's easy to rail off that number, but 37 trillion... That's a lot. And your subconscious mind controls all of those cells. When you sleep at night, it keeps you breathing. When you, it, when, you, know, when you sleep at night, you, you, or even during the day, you, know, you don't think about, you know, is my heart beating? You just know that because you're standing up, it is. The way your kidneys work, the way your liver works, the way your spleen works, the way your, your whole um, breathing works, your lungs, your whole, your whole respiratory system, all of that stuff, we don't think about. We just walk around and we do our thing. But God has given us a subconscious mind which works on all of those things. Isn't that phenomenal? Now let me tell you some characteristics about this conscious and the subconscious mind because I'm coming to a point, in case you didn't know. The conscious mind can accept or reject information, okay? Yeah. You know the castle, tell him he's dreaming. 
That's how you reject information. You know, I don't accept that. But the subconscious mind has no power to reject. It only has power to accept what the conscious mind gives it. This is true. This is absolute fact. The role of the subconscious mind is to bring to pass in your life the things that you believe. That's why once, and I've, some of you have heard this testimony before, but when I was a new Christian, there's a lady down the road from me about five doors who found out I was a Christian and she, she had occasion to speak to me and she said, oh, Colin, you know, every time I trust the Lord, there's a tragedy happens in my life. And she said, I'm so scared to trust the Lord. Now, I didn't have the wisdom to answer her as I would today back then, but the reason that was happening and the reason that negative things happen to us is because we believe negative things. We accept negative things. I could never get healed. God, God couldn't do that in me. You know, he might bless others, but he wouldn't bless me. You know, that's how Satan works in your mind to try and sow seeds to get you to accept less than God's fullness. That's why when you talk about all grace abounding, there's, there's more than enough. There's too much. It's overflowing, you know. Why not, why not get all that and pour it out onto others as well? Amen? If you've got an abundance, if you've got excess, why not give it to others? Amen? Hallelujah. God wants pressed down, shaken together and running over, as Luke 6.38 says. That's what God wants, the blessings to overflow you. And so if we're feeding our subconscious mind negative thoughts, negative things about ourselves, negative things, oh, you know, I'll never get a friend, you know, I'll never be able to do this. Debbie and I were with someone just two days ago that we were trying to convince just to believe God, that somebody who had made a decision for Jesus, but sadly had slipped away. And I, feel, I do feel sorry for that person. I'm not trying to cane them by making an example of them here today. But, but, you know, sometimes people get to a point, even Christians, where they just won't accept what God says. Because they believe the negative so much. And the reason they believe the negative is because what you believe your subconscious mind will attract to you. And you will get the negatives. And so that lady who had the problem with the tragedies, and I, it's amazing because just a few months ago, I talked to her daughter who was in a horrific car accident when I was in high school. Just out of the blue, this phone call came. Hi, it's Lorraine. Lorraine Bedson. Wow. Lived down the road when I was a kid. Her mother was believing for tragedy because she'd seen tragedy and she couldn't change her mind about it. She didn't understand this truth, that you can change your mind in a second, in a millisecond. We get this idea that, you know, oh, gee, I've got to work on my mind. I've got to, you know, I've got to, I've got to start working on my mind. And, you know, it's like trying to give up cigarettes or something like that or some sort of habit that you have. The more you concentrate on it, the more you're thinking about the habit, so the more you do it. I'm just busting for a cigarette. I'm trying to give it up, but I'm busting for a cigarette. Why? Because you're thinking about the cigarette. And so we create these things. I'm not trying to put blame any, on anybody or anything like that because I want you to have God's grace and God's blessing, but we can block it ourselves. We can stop this coming to ourselves by our own thinking. And we need to correct ourselves in these areas. If we're believing for healing, believe for healing. Wipe everything else out of your mind. Don't even think about it. Cast your cares upon him because he cares for you, 1 Peter 5, 7 says. We want to walk in the liberating power of God. Amen? Amen. And you know what? The first person to convince these things to is you. <laughs> Easy to convince others. But try to teach yourself a lesson. That's another animal altogether. <laughs> Praise the Lord. 
And that's why the Bible says in Proverbs, I think it's Proverbs, I might be, oh yeah, Proverbs, um, what's that verse? 1632, where the God says, greater is he that, uh, than a man that takes a city who controls his own spirit. I can't think of it. Look it up for me, darling. I'd like to prove that it's there. used to know that and it just won't come to me. All right. Thank you, Jesus, it will, because I have all grace abounding to me. <laughs> so Paul is saying he's there with his speech and his preaching and, 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 and not with enticing words of man's wisdom. You know, Paul is saying here, I was nervous, I was scared, I, I, was, I was stumbling over words, but I came in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Amen. And that's all we need. We don't need eloquent words. We just need the power of God upon us. Okay, let's go to number five. Number five. Okay, the power of thought is the only thing over which any human being has complete unquestionable means of control. Do you know that each one of us there's only one thing we totally control ourselves. No one else can interfere with it. That's our thoughts. That's our thoughts. You have total control over your mind. No one else can interfere with it. People can try to manipulate you. They can try to convince you of false things. But once again, you've got to check it out because if you agree with something that's wrong, you're going to attract the fruit of that to yourself. And God doesn't want you to do that. So Napoleon Hill says, the fact is so astounding that it connotes a close relationship between the mind of man and God. There are only five known things in the whole universe and out of those five, nature has shaped everything that's in existence from the smallest electrons and protons of matter on up to the highest stones that float out there in the heavens. It includes you and me. Just five things. I'm going to put a question to you. The first four are time, space, energy, and matter. That's four of the five. Anyone know what the fifth is? Pardon? No. You're going to hate me when I tell you. God. God. Did you say God? Yeah, he's. I, I, I refrain from telling a joke about a lawyer today. You should be thankful to me. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. Love you, Pete. Okay, it's God. So what are the five things? Time, space, energy, and matter, and God. Guess what? Without God, the other four are useless. The other four are useless. It's God and it reflects itself or himself in every blade of grass, everything that grows out of the ground and all of the electrons and protons. It reflects him in space and in time. In everything that is, there's intelligence operating all the time. This intelligence permeates the, permeates the whole universe, space, time, matter, energy, everything. The person who is the most successful is the one who finds ways and means of appropriating the most of this intelligence from God through his brain and putting it into action. Every individual has the privilege of appropriating to his own use as much of this intelligence as he chooses. It's up to us, isn't it? He can only appropriate it by using it. Just understanding or believing is not enough. You've got to put it into a specialised use in some form. Paul came in demonstration. He didn't just come preaching it. You know, I believe, saints, that if we're going to preach the gospel, then we need to demonstrate the gospel. Amen? We need to demonstrate. We need to show this world that God is real. Amen? We have the power. Yes? Jesus cried from the cross, it's finished. He'd done everything he can possibly do. 
to give us the tools to preach the gospel, to, to change the world. And 12 men, 12 men. It's hard to get 12 fingers up like that, isn't it? Um, 12 men turned the world upside down. Praise God. Okay, moving along. Let's go to number six, the sixth premise. The subconscious mind is a very powerful doorway of individual approach to the infinite power of God. Okay, so Napoleon Hill makes a comment here, the basis of approach is faith based upon definiteness of purpose. That one sentence gives you the whole key to that paragraph. Faith based upon definiteness of purpose. Do you have any idea why you don't have as much confidence in yourself as you should have? Have you ever stopped to think about that? Have you ever stopped to think about why it is? When you see an opportunity coming along on what you believe to be an opportunity, you begin to question your ability to embrace it and use it. Haven't you had that happen to you many times? Well, it can stop today. It can stop today because when you start to put into practice trusting God, believing him for answered prayer, believing him for miracles and signs and wonders, that lack of confidence will disappear. And you'll have every confidence in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Hallelujah. And that's where our faith needs to be at this time. When our faith is under attack, when churches are under attack, when Satan is moving in this world like times we've never seen in our lifetime we need to trust the lord saints we need to trust the lord he will always make a way he will always make a way number seven every brain is built as a broadcasting and receiving station for thought thoughts from both god and man you need to guard your mind from negative thoughts and words stay clear of negative people who might influence your thinking can I give an example to you? If you're believing for a loan, say you need a thousand bucks and you need it tomorrow, okay? You need to pay the food bill or the electricity bill or something like that. And you go down the bank and you think, oh man, you know, this guy, I know him. He's so negative. He's probably not going to give me a loan. You know, I've got no collateral, I've got nothing to show for it. And you go in there and you get rejected. Whose fault was it that you didn't get the loan? All very quiet. It's your fault. Because you set up that guy from the moment you walked in to pick up your negative vibes. And you didn't have the confidence to speak and overcome the doubt and the fear. And so you communicated that negativity to him. Think, who's going to give you a loan when, you, when you're doing that? When you're communicating it. When you could be praying and thanking the Lord from the moment you realize you need that money, that you're going to go down the bank and you are going to get $1,000. Amen? You are going to get it. You're going to get, you don't entertain ifs, buts and maybes, just go. And, and you know, one of the things we've got to watch as Christians, and, and this is where it gets down to, to tin taxes, you know, sometimes Christians try to put you off your belief. It's a terrible thing, but sometimes Christians will say, oh, you know, aren't you going up a little bit too far? Hey, can you ever go too far in God? God wants us to believe him, saints. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. The just shall... Hey, that's a chant, isn't it? You ready? The just shall live by faith. Come on. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. Good to have fun in church. So, if you want a good uh, illustration, that's it, eh? I mean, how many times can people speak to you negatively and make you question? Make you think, maybe I am out on the limb a little bit. You know, maybe I am getting over the top a little bit. You know, there's nothing wrong with checking. But when you come out with, no, I'm not over the top, I'm trusting the Lord. Stay with it. Amen? Stay with it. Don't be convinced. 
Don't be convinced. Okay, quickly. Let's go to our next slide. Faith is like radar that sees through the fog. Corrie ten Boom. Hallelujah. When you can't see the way, have faith. Trust the Lord. When you haven't got a, a leading from God, an answer from God, what should you do? Trust the Lord. That's right. Wait. Trust on the Lord. Wait on Him. Amen? Next one. Faith isn't faith until it's all you're holding on to. Yep, there's times, Debbie and I, you know, we've had a few dollars in the bank and we've had to pay a bill or something or God tells us to give it away and we just go, okay, praise the Lord. That's when you have faith, <laughs> when there's nothing else. Praise the Lord. Next one. Faith allows things to happen. It's the power that comes from a fearless heart. And when a fearless heart believes, miracles happen. Woo! Give me a woo. Oh, hallelujah. That was, that was two fingers. Okay, next one. Scriptures that encourage faith. Let's go through these. And you probably know these, but with that new understanding of what you should feed your mind, your subconscious mind, and, and, and get this, I didn't say it, but I said there's something like 37 trillion plus cells in your body. Do you know your, your subconscious mind runs these? It runs those cells. So if you're feeding your subconscious mind negative, evil thoughts, guess what you're feeding your body? Guess what you're feeding every cell? Napoleon Hill did, a, did an exercise once. They went to somebody and they, they're just visiting and got the friends, set the friends up to say, are you okay? You, you, you don't look real wonderful. The guy goes, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Okay. Praise the Lord. Go away, come back next time. Man, are you okay? You, you're not looking real good. Should you see a doctor? Well, actually, you know, I haven't been feeling that wonderful. You should see a doctor. Well, maybe I'll go next week. Turn up. Third time. The guy's coughing and spluttering. <laughs> and he's, he, his nose is stuffed up and he's, he's going to see the doctor tomorrow. <laughs> you know? It's like you can convince people of things that are totally not true. And because you attract what you believe, these things come upon you. So when someone tries to put something on you, don't rebuke them, okay? Unless, you know, it's somebody you know you can speak to that way, but just say in your mind, I'm not receiving that in Jesus' name. I'm not having that in Jesus' name. That's not coming upon me. Debbie and I got a prophecy once after coming through something very difficult, and the prophecy was, uh, you'll have three bad years. We said, thank you. We walked away and I said to Debbie as before we got to our seat, we're not having that in Jesus' name. We've had enough of that stuff. It's time, for, it's time for spring, you know, winter's gone. Praise the Lord. Okay, so Hebrews 11.1, 1, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's a powerful verse. Faith is a substance. Can you, can you think about it that way? It's a substance. When you have faith, it's the substance of what you're hoping for. And it's, I, I say quite often that, you know, when you believe in God for a miracle, he'll start to give you, you know, like a window will open and the breeze will blow through and you think, oh, look, you know, something's happened that is almost according to what I'm praying, but it hasn't quite fully happened yet. It's just the beginning of that thing happening. Praise God. Hang in there. Hang, the other thing I need to say to you is when you're believing for something, don't get, don't get put off if it gets worse first, <laughs> okay? Because I've seen it many times that when you're believing for a miracle, the situation gets worse just before the breakthrough. You know, the person's going to die of that cancer. They only have weeks to live. And who are you trying to tell them to believe God? You know, believe God. Amen? That's what we need to do, believe God. Okay, the next one's Hebrews 11.6. And I can quote that too, and it's almost quoted there. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For all who come to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. 
He rewards those who have faith. He rewards you just for having faith. I believe God. You might not have anything to believe God for, but just believe him. Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I'm on the starting peg. I'm ready to go. As soon as that gun goes off, man, I'm gone. I'm gone with you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I'm at the front of the pack. I'm not sitting back. I'm going forward. I'm trusting you, Lord. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Every day, you'll live by faith. Every moment of every day, you'll live by faith. Yes, we'll get distracted when we have different responsibilities to do, but just get back to God. As Sue said earlier in communion, just, just get back to it. Just get back to praying. Just get back to believing Him. Just get back to keeping communication open with the Lord. Keep reading the Word. When you get, get time, you know, read a chapter of the Word or read a verse. Okay, next one. I've quoted this a couple of times already today. 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of fear, folks, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen? Just close your eyes for a minute, lift your hands and say, thank you, Lord. You've not given me the spirit of fear, but of power, love and a sound mind. So fear, get out of my head. Get out of my body. In Jesus' name, I'm not having you. We're getting a divorce. And I'll get all the, all the spoils in Jesus' name. Amen? Praise God. Okay, sorry. Okay, next. 1 John 5, 4. For everyone who's born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Our faith. Overcomes all things. Praise God. Please, don't go out there today and just slide back into normality. Go out there today believing God for your life. That, look, there's so many needs out there, you don't have to look too far to find them. Amen? <laughs> and start with yourself. Amen? Believe God for yourself. Like I said during the sermon, self is the hardest one to believe for. Because, you know, we have all those guilts. You know, I know... I know how, what, a, what a bad person I am. I know what I'm like. I know the negative thoughts I have. I know I don't deserve this. Well, sure. <laughs> you believe that, you're not going to get it. You're not going to get it. Sure you don't deserve it. Of course you don't deserve it. You are a sinner. You dirty, rotten sinner. But Jesus came and saved you. You are in the dock. You're in the dock, you know, and the jury just said, guilty. And Jesus walked up for you and said, I'll take their place. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. That's the grace that we have in Jesus Christ. A couple of posters and then we're done. Never lose hope. Just when you think it's over, God sends a miracle. Remember I just said a moment ago about things often get worse before they get better. That don't stop believing God just because things get worse. Just because the doctor comes up to you and says there's no hope, hey, there's always hope in God. Amen. You don't have to be rude and disrespect that, but what you can do is just say, Lord, in your head, I'm not receiving that in Jesus' name. Next one. A couple more and then we're done. Those who leave everything in God's hand will eventually see God's hand in everything. Okay, I think it's one more and we're done. Or is that it? Man says, show me and I'll trust you. God says, trust me and I'll show you. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I think that's it. Can we stand in his presence? Come on, do you want to change today? Praise the Lord. Thank you, that one person who said they did. Praise God. Let's lift our hands to him. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for this precious, precious, precious group of people. I ask your blessing to be upon each and every one, Father, right now. As you lift your hands, you're like a child receiving. Just, just receive from him. Say, thank you, Dad. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the blessing. Thank you, Lord, that you brought me this far by your grace. And Lord, help me to go on 
in your power, Lord, like Paul did, Lord. I'm not always confident. I'm not always feeling strength. But, Lord, whether I feel it or not, you're there and you're my strength. You're our strength, Lord. You're our strength. And, Lord, in you, we will never, ever fail. Praise you, Jesus. We thank you for that assurance. Help us to go forward, Lord. Help us to find our calling. Help us to walk in our passion. Help us, Lord, to do the things that you've called us to do. Oh, Father, without fear or favour, Lord, that we just become your humble servants who stand before you in faith, Lord, and see miracles happen in Jesus' name. Amen. All the power of God lies in you. Amen. Praise God. God bless you. We're dismissed today in Jesus' name.